we've added to the seminar on on the European data space. This is part of this uh, small series of very informal catching up uh, between friends seminars that uh, are hosted by Edge Riders, but everybody's really welcome uh, to, to, to have a seminar. Just contact us or me personally and we'll, we'll make it happen. So today we are uh, going to be learning about uh, uh, some kind of restructuring of uh, European data policies that have, uh, have, of course, have a long history since the, you know, the, the old hands here will remember the, the, the PSI directive uh, in uh, well, over, over 10 years ago. Uh, but now it seems that there is a geopolitical slant to this whole space. So I, I personally know very little about the matter. So I'll just going to give the floor to Ton without further ado. Maybe Ton, if you want to introduce yourself as a, at the very beginning, this is I also will. useful documentation for the people watching us on, on the video. And then there will be time for questions and answers as, as always. So over to you, Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Alberto. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm seeing a couple of familiar faces. Uh, Ricardo Cambiassi, that's been a long time. Hi, good to see you. <laughs> um, good to see you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, and indeed, Alberto, as you say, um, um, the stuff that we're going to talk about today has um, uh, a pretty long history, you know, and, and you, you mentioned the PSI directive. Uh, and, um, and as, as a brief introduction uh, on my background, I'll talk a little bit about that history. Um, on the, at the bottom of this slide, you see uh, my contact details. Um, the URL at the bottom is where you will find the slides as a download already. It's not an embeddable uh, version yet, um, uh, but you find the PDF of the slides there so you can have a local copy. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working on open government data since about 2008 which is shortly after the uh, original PSI directive, which regulated the reuse of government data uh, came into force. And since then it's been evaluated a couple of times and revised and I've been usually been part of the uh, assessment research uh, uh, that was done for that. And um, um, in its latest incarnation, it also makes it mandatory for governments to publish what is called high value data. And uh, uh, I've been involved, uh, as was Maurizio, uh, in the study that uh, was uh, used to, to build the list of high value data. And I did the, uh, the areas for Earth observation, environment, and meteorology. And uh, Maurizio was involved in the geodata uh, uh, theme for that. Um, in my um, uh, spare time, I also do things that have to do with open. I'm uh, a board member of the Open State Foundation, which is into open government. Uh, and I'm also part of the Dutch Creative Commons chapter called Open Netherlands. Um, most of my open data work has been in the Netherlands and within the EU, but I've also worked on open data uh, across the globe, usually Central Asia, uh, non-EU Eastern Europe, uh, former uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, countries. Um, at the top of this slide, you see a logo uh, by Geonovum. Um, and that's not my organization, but it's a client I currently work for. Uh, um, this is the second year that I, for them, uh, and the Ministry of the Interior closely follow the uh, incoming EU digital and data related legislation. I'll remove the plant here from the camera. And, um, um, uh, and I follow it with a mind to how to translate that to how government data holders, for instance, in the Netherlands could respond to that or how they could entice their stakeholders, external stakeholders to better use the opportunities provided. Um, um, this topic, however, is not just uh, something that I do for a client. I'm deeply involved and interested in, in everything that has to do with it. 
and I've been blogging about uh, related topics and these topics uh, for a long time. Um, so into the data space. Um, well, I, I'm not sure what your personal experience with European legislation is, but it, um, um, uh, what you tend to see is that pieces of legislation are usually discussed on their own as a single entity uh, where different types of lobbyists have an influence on it. And uh, it may be part of a larger uh, vision, uh, uh, but uh, it's usually treated as a thing on its own. And the uh, legal instruments that I, I would like to introduce to, to you today are different than, from that in the sense that they Seem, to, seem and read as a coherent whole, and that together they have a purpose. Um, um, and that purpose is that the EU is basically formulating its geopolitical proposition uh, uh, concerning everything digital and data. And that is a geopolitical proposition that is different from, let's say, the American mo model of maximum value extraction and, and maybe the more uh, centralized uh, um, uh, authoritarian approach that uh, is uh, prevalent elsewhere. And the proposition is twofold that the EU is formulating. One part is that they want to maximize the social benefits of using the opportunities that digitization and data provide, and at the same time, strengthen, uh, not just protect, but strengthen the citizen rights and European values. And as we've seen with the GDPR and also, for instance, environmental uh, uh, demands and, and other legislation, EU legislation is the EU's biggest export product. It's a way of setting global norms um, by saying, well, if you want to enter our market, currently the biggest market, then you have to comply with those norms. And that tends to uh, create a ripple effect across the world where other people are also applying those norms, even though it just is a European law. Um, what is also interesting about this set of data and digitization related uh, uh, regulations is that they're closely tied to actual uh, policy goals. So if you read the Green Deal and the policy instruments that are being created there, basically they say we are dependent on uh, the European digital and data policy or uh, data strategy also being implemented. So we cannot make the Green Deal transitions if we also don't uh, make uh, the uh, digital and data strategy happen. Um, and what that implies together is that where until now European data related legislation was focused on, uh, let's say, uh, data provision. Now, all of a sudden, the yardstick for success is the impact of using that data, which is a very different approach. If you look, for instance, at Inspire, which was about getting geodata used um, uh, across the EU, that it was all about, you know, uh, harmonizing that data, making it available in a proper way. Uh, but there never was much discussion on the actual impact of its usage. And this is different here. It starts from the impact. Um, and that, that's interesting um, uh, because it's a major switch in viewpoint for most data holders if they were indeed required to do that. Um, so what's coming our way? Uh, it's a large set of uh, legal instruments, um, uh, new ones, uh, and it includes one that's already there, which is the GDPR, which has been in place uh, since uh, uh, 2018, or at least been enforced since 2018. Um, what you see on the screen here is uh, six um, regulations. Uh, the left five of them are actual regulations, so they will enter into force of law uh, once they are agreed across the EU. There's no need for them to be translated into national legislation. And the sixth one is the Open da Data Directive, formerly the PSI Directive. And that one is a directive, so that one needs to be translated into national law before it can be uh, applied. Um, all of them 
are tied to two more generic things. One is the digital compass, which sets, let's say, digitization goals for 2030 and 35, and, um, and the, sets of, uh, the set of digital rights and principles, which is an attempt by the EU. Uh, it's called, I think, a solemn declaration or something like that. It's a, uh, as a, an attempt by the EU to, to make a translation of uh, a number of um, uh, civic rights and uh, principles into what they look like in a digital realm. So if you look at, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, regulation concerned with uh, uh, employee well-being, what would that mean uh, in an online or digital environment? And then it says, well, there's a right to switch off, for instance, uh, that your employer cannot require you to be online 24-7, just as he cannot require you to be in the office 24-7. So it's a, a translation of existing rights and principles to the digital realm. And they take that as a starting point for these instruments. Um, the left half of this is basically part of what's called the digital strategy. Um, and it is comprised of the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act and the AI regulation. And those first two, the Markets Act and Services Act, basically look at uh, the responsibilities of everyone who provides a digital platform or digital service in the EU market. And uh, now the, uh, you know, so the market sector is focused on the, on the big companies, the dominant ones, and talks about things as service neutrality, uh, and has measures to, to counter lock-in. Basically, it says if you're a gatekeeper, you have a special responsibility uh, to uh, create a level playing field for other service providers who are not, who are not as big as you. So it tries to address this sort of power asymmetry that is inherent in, in these highly dominant uh, platforms. And the Digital Services Act basically applies to everybody else who provides a digital service unless you're uh, a, a small company. So it's still aimed at bigger companies. Um, what's interesting here is that it introduces needs for interoperability, uh, 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 a transparency in how you uh, use data that you collect about your, the, the, the users of your platforms, uh, that you need to prove that you actually create a level playing field. So there's a, a lot of instruments here that try to, uh, let's say, break down the mo monolithic power that these services usually have. Um, they've both been proposed at the end of 2020 and are currently agreed. So they um, um, uh, will enter into force later this year. Um, they have, um, uh, uh, like the GDPR, have uh, fine structures behind them if you uh, break the rules, and, and they're similar to the GDPR. So if you run afoul out of the Digital Markets Act or Services Act, that might land you fines in at the, uh, I think it's it's eight or 10% of your global annual turnover. So, it's, so there's, uh, like the GDPR, similar style consequences if you break the rules. Um, those are services, and, uh, um, and then there's the AI regulation, which I think is, uh, as far as um, technology regulation goes, quite an elegant uh, approach. Uh, of course, it's, you know, the pitfall when you try to regulate technology is that whatever you write down is not future-proof. Technology will be different tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and luckily, they haven't done that with this AI regulation. What they have done is say, OK, uh, if you want to introduce an AI uh, product on the European market, you have to abide by certain rules. And those rules are more strict if um, the risks that are attached to your AI product are higher. And uh, so they have defined a couple of technologies where they say, if you use this or this method, technological method, you are within scope of the AI regulation and that list can be amended over time. And then they say you have to do a risk assessment. And that means that if your AI tool is operating, uh, for instance, in, um, uh, in the environment of critical infrastructures, or it has to do with operating vehicles, or 
it directly addresses something that might impact civic rights, then it's in a high risk category. And it means that you have to be fully transparent about how your algorithms work, what they do. You have to demonstrate and ensure that over the entire lifetime of your AI product, that it keeps working as intended. You have to monitor for unintended consequences, all that sort of thing. And that responsibility does not just lie with the producer of the product, but it lies with the distributor of the product, with the user of the product, and with the user of the results of the product. So even if you don't use the AI product itself in the European market, but you use its output, these rules still apply. And that's an interesting approach to find because it tries to, to put it along the entire chain of users and not just in one spot. Um, this one has been proposed um, uh, in the spring of last year, still very much under discussion. Um, so it will be uh, uh, interesting to see what comes out of the negotiation process. But I think it's a, uh, an interesting balancing act that they say, uh, 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 we're gonna assess risk. We're not going to regulate technology, but we're going to regulate uh, products on the market and we assess risk amongst others based on the risk to civic rights. Um, now these three put together, these are all, let's say services and they use lots of data. Um, and the other parts uh, which form the data strategy are focused on how do we make more data usable for services, for AI, for whatever uh, uh, geared towards social uh, impact um, uh, and how do we make that possible in a responsible way? Um, the, let's say the simplest one of those three that you see here, Data Governance Act, the Data Act, and the Open Data Directive. The simplest one is the Open Data Directive, which is a continuation of the PSI Directive, uh, which regulates how we as citizens can access uh, data that is held by a government entity. And this new incarnation of it does two interesting new things. One is that it brings a dip, different type of organization into scope, which is public undertaking. Uh, these are uh, non-government entities that are financed or controlled in majority by the government, usually because they also execute some type of public task. And then the rules for the PSI directive apply to whenever these type of organizations for those public tasks publish or share some type of data. And that, uh, so the type of organization that is in scope with this are utility companies, uh, e electricity network uh, providers, uh, airports, harbors. Uh, in the Netherlands, it will be the, the national train company. These are all private entities, but they are financed and controlled through uh, government entities. And they are within scope. That does not mean that they have to open up all their data, but it does mean that if that you can ask them for data and that if they uh, agree with your request, that they have to provide that data under the same conditions as government would have to do, which means machine readable, uh, uh, only at most at marginal cost, uh, those type of things. And the second new element in it is that for the very first time, uh, the Open Data Directive actually makes it mandatory for governments to open up certain data. And so now all of it was voluntary. Uh, um, you know, a lot of governments in the EU started publishing all kinds of things, but now for the first time, there are mandatory data sets that need to be published and they are called the high value data sets. Um, what they are, we don't know yet. Uh, I said at the start, Maurizio and I, we were involved in, in, in the... Uh, research for, for what to put on that list in its first uh, version. Uh, we looked at si six different themes, um, but uh, we did that research and we finalized it in September 2020. And since then, there's basically been total si silence uh, from the commission on this. Um, uh, latest I heard is that they started looking at it again after uh, February and that they hope that in a couple of months they might be at the point where they can publish it. The sticking point is that there's a lot of political resistance to opening up the uh, company registers, which also includes the ultimate beneficial ownership information, for instance. 
the rest is not that uh, uh, controversial, but that's the bit where there's a lot of resistance. Um, how it will end up, we won't know we, until it's published. Uh, uh, word from the commission is that they're nearly there, but uh, uh, to me, it seems like, like it might still be some time. So these are um, a number of, of large legal instruments that together form one single framework. And, um, and, you know, and if you would leave it at that, then uh, it would still mean that everybody would make their own interpretation of how to apply it, how to implement it. Um, uh, and, uh, and basically, I'm not, not, maybe not to prevent it, but to strengthen this, um, the EU is also initiating uh, programs and financing instruments uh, and research to find a way of implementing this in what they call the EU data space. And that's an interesting uh, thing, uh, the EU data space, because basically they're saying we're going to create a single market for the uh, sharing and usage of data. And, um, you know, and that sort of that term single market, of course, is a huge uh, signal flag uh, because it means that it will involve everybody. These are just the rules of the road for using data in the EU. And that it's not about when they talk, and it also means that when they talk about European data space, it's not just about technology. And it's not about centralizing anything. It's about setting the rules for interaction between all actors in the EU when it comes to data sharing and data usage. Um, so it will be a single market for data. And that is how the instruments in those laws that I just mentioned will get expressed and, and how they will you know, create and, uh, and make manifest. And um, because it will not be, let's say, a single centralized structure of anything, uh, they say, OK, we will uh, make it happen sector by sector because in a sector, there's already a lot of things in place that they want to connect up. Uh, a leading, um, let's say, instrument for prioritization is the, the amount of support that it can give to existing policy goals. Think energy transition, farm to fork, uh, 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 healthcare, that sort of thing. And it will set for everybody the, the overall environment that covers every data transaction that you might think of. What it will look like is still highly undefined, but I'll give you an in, in, uh, impression nonetheless. Um, but they have start, started preparations by issuing uh, calls for proposals and opening up financing streams through the Digital Europe program, which is a financing vehicle. Um, if you look through the uh, uh, let's, the, the documentation that they have published for these financing uh, possibilities, I guess you an inkling of what they are looking at when they talk about a thematic data space. So you have the unified market, which is the EU data space within it, within it you have different sectors and themes. And uh, for some of those themes, they have issued a call for proposals. So this is the, the, the text from that proposal for the Green Deal data space. And you know, the, what stands out is that they do, they don't necessarily only talk about technology. So it's about data governance schemes. There's a priority list of data sets involved. Uh, they want a roadmap. They also talk about the type of data that might be in there, which is the high value data sets as mentioned, but also inspire satellite imagery like from the Copernicus services, um, um, uh, public data or government data that isn't public, uh, and existing uh, data infrastructures. So basically, they're going to bring together all kinds of disparate pieces of the puzzle uh, and you know, create an environment where that can be uh, responsibly uh, exchanged and used. Um, like I said, we don't really know what this data space will be, but the contours are emerging of it. And what is emerging is, um, uh, what I try to uh, illustrate here, and basically it's sort of a, a lasagna of, of, of different elements, you know, stacked on top of each other. 
So there is a technological layer involved, um, uh, but it's envisioned as a federated cloud infrastructure. Basically, it's the, you know, the computing infrastructure that you need to be able to exchange large volumes of stuff, data in this case, or to run applications on. Um, so uh, a thing like the Gaia X program is part of, of that layer. Um, and again, it's not envisioned as a centralized thing. It's tying stuff together. And on top of that, if you have this technological infrastructure, you also need generic uh, governance principles that govern the exchanges that might take place over that infrastructure. Um, and so the Data Governance Act creates something that's called the Data Innovation Board. And like the European Data Protection Agency, it's an EU level unit that will set the general uh, rules uh, governing data exchanges, uh, will set rules for interoperability, and will uh, uh, be, uh, let's say, the conduit for standards to be established. And they will at first specifically look at the interoperability and bridging of gaps between different sectors on the assumption that within a sector existing stakeholders might be better positioned to already you know, connect things up. So they will set, set the pan-European rules. Then above that you have for each sector uh, what they call a separate data space but it's basically just a corner of the entire thing where uh, professional entities, users, governments, NGOs, whatever stakeholders uh, uh, connect the things that they want to connect to be able to share, use, and exchange all kinds of data. And they do this because in each sector, there are already uh, you know, usually standards in place. You know, I mentioned the, the high value data study. I looked at meteorology and Meteo is already a sector where there is a global system of exchange uh, of data and uh, they have globally set standards. There is a, 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 a strong professional tradition in how to organize and do that. And you don't want to pull that apart. You want to build on that. So they say, basically, in any sector, you already have these kinds of agreements. You already have these rules of the road. You already have standards and, 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 um, and interfacing, uh, let's say, traditions or customs. Let's build on that. And then bridge those things together, and then you have a, a single European data space. This sectoral approach um, uh, also means that regardless of those large scale uh, legal uh, instruments you just saw, that uh, smaller directives that just deal with one sector, when they are being revised, are now also being rewritten in the spirit of the digital and data uh, strategies. So an example would be the Inspire Directive, which is currently under review. Uh, it will be rewritten in a way that it's more useful to a Green Deal data space. Uh, the ITS Directive, which deals with intelligent transport systems, so that sensor data from roads and, and trucks and that sort of thing, um, is already, already being rewritten in the image of the data strategy. And that means that it probably be uh, will also bring in-car data into play uh, where it currently doesn't. And it also means that every single instrument that is in those large-scale uh, laws is somehow uh, uh, to be expressed in this environment. And I'll get to a number of those instruments uh, in a minute. So again, it's not centralized, it's federated, things are being connected. Uh, in this space, it's needed that you can set your own rules if you share something and that those rules are basically, let's say, automatically or automatically uh, being enforced within the data space. Uh, that will save you from having to arrange conditions with every exchange that you make you uh, um, um, uh, and to then personally enforce it. Uh, so it creates a, an environment where that uh, will be arranged, but it also means that uh, that will have uh, a normative um, setting, not just for the data, but also for each and every application that you build on top of that. Um, because if you build an application uh, or a digital twin, or you have an AI application, 
it will depend on data that is being made available in the data space. And if you want to share or do something with its outputs, then by default, that is data that is being made available in this single European market called the data space. And that means that the principles that govern the data space will, be, will have to be adopted uh, by the applications that you put on top of it, because otherwise it would not be able to interact with this single market for data uh, to get its data or share its result. And that is reflected in, for instance, how the EU itself talks about digital twins. So there's a, a digital twinning program called Destiny, Destination Earth, which is a digital twin of the Earth for uh, climate uh, uh, impacts. And it's not seen as one single digital twin. It's seen as an aggregate, as a, as a federated system of digital twins, one for the oceans, one for the North Sea, a digital twin that covers the coastal region of some country, uh, uh, you know, uh, digital twins that, that, that model uh, uh, clouds and, and rain above the continent, whatever. And they put all that together, at least that's how they envision it. Uh, and that is the, the uh, digital twin of the earth. So that same federating principle that is being applied at the, at the infrastructure level that is being uh, used in thinking about exchanging and using data is, is copied onto this thinking of digital twins. And they look similarly at AI applications. Um, and that's also why the digital services and market sites are part of the pa this package, because they set rules for services and applications that you make. Um, like I said, this is the, uh, uh, the conceptual space in which all those laws need to be expressed. And, uh, um, and I think what might be interesting also for the discussion is to look at the individual instruments that are part of those laws and, and see how they might play out. And um, so there's a couple of things in those uh, laws that are novel so and I'll, I'll go through a few of them and maybe in a, also given time uh, may, maybe in the discussion we, we can cover a few more um we talked about open data we talked about uh, uh, government data being public but there's also always a large part of government data that is not public think of the micro data of the statistics office think of person related data that might be in a person register or might be in whatever other register. The Data Governance Act has a provision that says there must be ways for you to apply to use that non-public data because there's still a huge amount of potential societal value in that data. But of course, the GDPR and confidentiality agreements still apply. So it means that there must emerge ways of using the data without actually having the data. And this, and you know, I've been discussing this with the, with the Dutch statistics office and things that they, that, that, uh, that we envision here is that you could bring your model to the statistics office and have it trained with their micro data without you having access to the micro data or that you provide a query to some government entity. And if it's generic enough, you get the results back, but not the underlying data that informed the answer. Uh, and that way you can make use of large data sets that you would not otherwise have never access to. So that's an interesting one. Um, another um, uh, interesting one, I think is um, also in the Data Governance Act and it's called data altruism. And uh, this is where you as a citizen supply your person uh, identifiable data uh, to a specific uh, um, uh, general benefit cause, but not, not through, not directly to a project, but through an intermediary that is basically an, uh, 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 public benefit organization that collects the data uh, ensures that they have the, the, the consent agreements with you and then on request supplies that data to uh, specific um, you know, research or use cases that fit with the mission of that data altruistic uh, entity. Um, 
in the past, I've been part of a, of a uh, project where we wanted to collect uh, the actual experiences of patients in the healthcare system. And one of the uh, uses for that was that insurance companies were interested in how care was actually perceived. But there's no way that you would actually want to provide patient, individual patient information to a uh, healthcare insurer because they might start using it to, to calculate premiums or whatever. You know? And at the same time, those insurers never want to touch that data because they don't want to even be seen as potentially interested in something that they might use nevariously. In that case, a, a data altruistic entity might be a solution because it puts a filter in front of whatever is the use case, and you already up front have discussed the, uh, the situations under which that data might be applied uh, for uh, uh, things like uh, 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 general benefit re, uh, research. So that's an, uh, it's a novel thing, didn't exist before, uh, and uh, is, of, I think, of high interest. Another uh, one I uh, want to highlight from this list is that um, already there is something called the PSD2 uh, directive, which allows you to open up your banking information to an app builder or to another bank than the one that you have an account with. So for instance, uh, you can use the uh, ING banking app to uh, check your ABN uh, banking account uh, because you can uh, demand that that data, that banking data is being made available to a third party. Uh, the Data Act contains provisions that basically does that for everything that generates data by you using a product or service. Think about, you know, when you drive around in your car, your car is collecting data that is currently only accessible uh, to your dealer. Um, this makes it mandatory that it's also accessible for you and that you can uh, provide access to a third party on your behalf uh, for them to use it in an application or in a service. Uh, and um, this is aimed squarely at all you know, IoT devices and services uh, and that sort of thing. So it's basically a PSD2 for everything. Um, and the Data Act, in order to arrange for that, also re, uh, remove some and clarity in the interpretation of database rights where they explicitly confirm once more that if generating data, building a database is a side effect of something else, you cannot as a company claim any database rights on it. And that means you cannot use database rights as a way of keeping others out of that data, which is also a, a, a highly interesting element. So these are all new instruments um, and you know, that are up for debate. How do they you know, create actually societal value from that data? Uh, are they primarily a tool for governance or stewardship? Uh, do they require common facilities or infrastructure to be able to use them? So each of these basically is a question to each data using or holding organization. How do these instruments apply to us? Um, and, and that sort of brings us to, to uh, not a conclusion, but to a broad field of questions that this raises. Um, you know, how are you going to leverage the tools that are in here? Um, this switch from thinking about data provision to let's start from the actual impact that we want to achieve. Uh, you know, um, who do you want to mobilize to, to actually articulate the demand or the questions or the, you know, the type of impact that you want to achieve with this data? Um, and how do you align all the different kinds of efforts that different stakeholders, different member states uh, are making in this area. Uh, and, and, and how do you find, let's say, allies in, in emphasizing the type of use and the type of impact that you seek? And, and if you have you know, use cases that are relevant here, uh, can you use them to take a, a, a proactive posture to the EEC um, uh, to influence how this actually is taking shape? You know, um, Geonovum, uh, the logo that you see on top, uh, they have a memorandum of, of understanding with the JRC, which is the research branch of the European Commission. 
And the JRC looks at the Netherlands as, okay, it's highly digitized, has a lot of uh, glass fiber to the home, uh, very densely populated. So it's a, um, you know, for them, it's a big sandbox uh, where they think, you know, uh, a good place to try things out uh, at, a, you know, at a nice scale. And, we're, and so they're interested in what's happening here in the Netherlands uh, to see how their sort of general rules or general uh, framework plays out in practice. Uh, but it also means that those cases will be influencing how this is being interpreted in practice. Uh, so it becomes important to think about with what type of use cases, what type of suggestions you know, are you going to approach the decision makers here? Uh, because those examples that you come up with will set the tone for the type of thing that will get implemented. So that's a, an interesting uh, generic uh, question. Um, and, and that's basically where we currently are. There's a, a, a not a whole lot of answers. There's loads of questions. And there's a bunch of new legal instruments that we have to figure out how to use uh, responsibly and, uh, and with impact. And with that, uh, it's time for, for discussion, I think. Stop sharing. Okay, so let's, let's go. I have some questions of my own, but I don't wanna kind of dominate. So I'm going to leave a floor to anybody else that might want to, to start and join the queue. I guess just jump in. There's, there's, we are few enough that we could uh, just jump in without too many raising yeah. of hands and stuff like that. Which usually, this type of overviews are sort of a, a humongous wave of information. So <laughs> it may take some time to. <laughs> to find an entry point to start asking questions. Indeed. Indeed, okay, while, while people are thinking about it, then I, I guess I'll, I'll slip in my own uh, question. I, I have several, but I guess the, the main one is, uh, it starts how you, with, with the text that, that you sent me to introduce the seminar, Tom, and, and the idea was there is a geopolitical angle here yeah. It's, it's quite mature. I mean, we've come a long way since the early days and you, you can see that there is a lot of thinking and some, some tools are, are, are quite sophisticated and, and the commission is growing into its strength in, into its role as, as, as making this kind of complicated regulation. But what I'm not seeing so clearly is the uh, connection to this uh, big discussions that we've been hearing the last two years about digital sovereignty and you know there, there is the you know the Chinese model here and there is the American model there but we are not like that we are the European Union and we need to kind of play our regulatory superpowership in a way that we don't get crushed mm -hmm. and so uh, do you have any breakdown of how the framework as you as you explained it to us would do this job um yeah i think in in um in several ways so um i think the the biggest contrast with let's say the the uh the big tech platforms that we're used to is that the American model is we'll focus on value extraction no matter what. And the EU's proposition, uh, proposition is, yes, we are interested in value uh, extraction, but it definitely matters what. And, um, and they apply that in, 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 along several ways. One of them is that they, they start out with these digital rights and principles, which is how do we want to translate civic rights to, uh, to, to digital policy, uh, which is made most manifest, I think, or most tangible in uh, the AI regulation, where they say if there's a risk uh, to uh, AI decisions impacting citizens, for instance, when it's social credit systems or that sort of thing, 
uh, then it's either completely forbidden or it falls in the highest uh, risk classification. And that means it's highly regulated how you uh, uh, are able to enter the market. Um, uh, similar provisions are also in the, in the Digital Services Act. And the other thing is that um, uh, they, uh, at a lot of points, uh, introduce rules that are uh, geared towards uh, data portability and interoperability uh, that, you know, if uh, you're using one type of service, it must be easy to move to another one. Uh, and I think after two years of introductory time, it also must be free to migrate away from things to a, a similar service. Um, uh, the rules for the gatekeepers at the start, uh, you know, things like the interoperability between messenger services, uh, those are all sort of translations of that principle. And what it does in practice is that uh, it introduces civic rights and let's call them European values, but basically humanistic values as a, uh, as a touchstone for decision making in these laws. And, um, uh, and it uh, uh, tries to break silo forming, uh, not with uh, uh, anti-monopoly uh, uh, or anti-cartel legislation, but by requiring a certain type of structure in your service provision that has the same effect. Okay, uh, there's, there's a question here, but before you move on, I, I would like to do a, a very small follow-up, which is, okay, but where's the edge? So uh, is the commission saying, we are gonna give kind of better protection and, the, and a kind of more balanced approach, and this will, what, attract investments? I mean, there are two discourses, one is, if, if we have a solid legal framework, which is guaranteeing you know, personal rights and user mm -hmm. rights and competition, et cetera, then we'll be more efficient, we'll, we'll be more attractive and we'll win. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the opposite, it's saying, well, we are, we are constraining business and so business will migrate, we will lose investment, we will lose. And yeah. so I'm kind of interested on, on the general direction that this debate uh, took as uh, the commission and the other stakeholders were working on this framework. Yeah, I, I, I think there, there, there's two elements to it. So one is just the brute uh, uh, force that comes from being the largest, lar largest market. So they're not saying it will attract an investment as such, but it will export our norms to uh, outside the EU. And that in itself already levels the playing field for the type of companies that uh, that might want to uh, that would normally want to attract uh, through investment uh, you know they've done the same with with all kinds of production requirements where you know basically it's cheaper to run one production line that adheres to the most strict regulations than have several uh, where some have more lax rules because you don't have to be as strict in other markets uh, so it hinges on the fact that the EU still is the biggest market uh, in the world, you know, if that changes, then the entire uh, you know, construct here changes as well. The other thing is, um, and I think that one is less, less explicit, is that you know, up to 10 years ago, the commission would ask, where's the next Google? Uh, you know, and so uh, apparently in their mind, they were after that type of value creation for the European market. We want the European Google, where's the next Google? which was always an awkward question because you know Google wasn't visible as the next Google when they started out you know so the next Google might be two guys in Bulgaria in somewhere in a shed with a laptop uh, but we'll only know in 20 years right um, but that seems to have shifted to um, there are other measures of value creation and, and they made the climate transition and agricultural transition and energy transition and a couple of other policy elements they make into, uh, you know, they put into the core of what EU policy is currently about. And they starting to use that, that as a measure of success. So if this generates uh, activity and services and uh, uh, that contribute to the green transition, then that is successful and it doesn't need to produce another Google. Preferably not seems to be the reason, and that's a major shift. You know, it's not as explicit in the documentation, but it's a big shift in, in you know, the type of 
uh, sounds that you from the from parts of the commission because the commission of course is also not a single thing great that answers my question I also see a, a question in the uh, chat uh, by Ricardo. Plenty of state actors are setting regulations that limit data transfer abroad. How is the EU strategizing when it comes to seeking access to important sets of data available only in foreign markets? Um, that's that's a, a good one I, where I don't have a ready answer, I think. Um, are there any particular data sets that, that you're thinking of, Ricardo? Just in general, yeah. Um, yeah, I, of course, there, there, there used to be um, uh, the situation where most uh, Earth observation, or at least satellite Earth observation data, would be from outside the EU, and um, um, no problem. Um, um, and and the answer there has been not to to uh, uh, keep trying to get that data into Europe, but to create your own data source for it. Uh, uh, so Copernicus uh, services based on Sentinel data. Um, uh, uh, the AFIS service, where which is the forest fire service, which is basically the same as that Na Na NASA provides, but it's our, uh, the European equivalent, the GPS uh, uh, equivalent for Europe. Um, so I think in that sense that there has been some strategic deliberation. Um, uh, and I wonder about what, what other type of, of data sets um, that would be useful inside Europe, uh, if not sort of, uh, uh, but but originate elsewhere. I don't know. Um, but under everything currently, the basic ploy is if you want to be active in the European market, then you have to play by our rules, and that also goes, you know, uh, when it comes to, to uh, of course, as you know, in the GDPR to, to personal data, that if it's outside the EU, uh, but it's about Europeans, rules still apply. And um, uh, so I haven't encountered any other things that specifically look at data that they want to bring into Europe from, from elsewhere, apart from Earth observation, that is. But it's a good one. I'll, I'll write it down and, and add it to my, let's say, my, my radar or antenna for, <laughs> for scouting out bits and pieces of information. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good follow up, Alberto, Wh whether that means that if it's been created in a non compliant way, can we then still use it? The, of course, also it means that you would be. Well, my interpretation of the GDPR is definitely not. No, then no. The, the level playing field consists in the fact that even those that do have the data that cannot use it. Yeah. Now, how, how you enforce this is another story. But yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and 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 I think you know that. So your question is is uh, if you look at like I said at the AI regulation, um, that uh, even if you use the output of AI or algorithms from outside the EU inside the EU, that the output still needs to comply with the uh, with all the rules that apply to AI. And if you cannot prove that, you won't get market access. And I think that's sort of the the basic mechanism here. Yeah, Maurizio, you're right. There's, there's no, um, uh, let's say, actual data space example because uh, currently in existence, I would say, uh, other than uh, you know small networks of organizations that already exchange data between themselves, and uh, especially if they all also have some mechanism of enforcing uh, agreements between them. Um, and you're right. Uh, a lot of the discussion is currently focused on the technological layers, and um, uh, which is a huge pitfall, uh, and uh, it's a real problem. And um, it's um, you know you you see entities like Fraunhofer 
and TNO in the Netherlands jump on this, but they're all at the at the at the technological layer. And and whereas most of this is not written as a technology fix, yeah, you know, and there's a lot of uh, governance and and and. Uh, I, I see uh, a lot of discussion, but uh, not content. Yeah. Uh, if you speak about, for example, example about mobility or green deal, for example, if you, we speak about green deal or it's possible because if you start from uh, just special data there is inspired there is a lot of discussion so it's the, the starting point to, to begin to speak yeah. about but until now i i hear every day guy x guy x guy x yeah no that's very true and 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 it's it's not uh not just an issue at, at, at sort of the overall level it, it, i think it's um uh uh uh, the same or uh, in uh, within data holding organizations. So if I talk to uh, government entities like the statistics office or the uh, 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 ministry for, for uh, mobility in the Netherlands, there too, there's this disconnect between the data guys and the IT guys on one side and the policy guys on the other side. And if you ask the policy people, what is the type of impact that you want to achieve outside you know, when it comes to urban mobility, for instance? Yeah, but mobility uh, is another very important uh, point. And in my point uh, of view, our data space is very important because in the case of Italy, but it more or less is the same around, around Europe because after the, the, the research made together, I see more or less is the same problem. There are a lot of companies that are owned by the public administration. Yeah. And they are very relevant in the case of mobility. And if there are some very important companies, a very small, uh, small company, uh, it's hard to say, please join the data space because you have to create okay, the infrastructure and order. But I have not so much data to go inside. I'm ready to go inside if there are a lot of data. And my point of view, the policy point of view should be to go to create opportunity for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not only about speak about open data, one of the... Uh, critics I found in the document about the strategy where the Europeans started to speak about uh, data spaces. Until now, the government opened the data for the company, but without a feedback. Yeah. And the, the feedback, in my point of view, can be also by the company together. But until now, I think there are only some very big company with a, some vision, like, for example, Uber can go on to, to you and say, I'm here ready to give you the data, and then we start with agreement. And if you think, if you think this is a kind of example that can stay inside a, a data space, but the data space should be very, very big to accept no other kind of uh, opportunity like Uber, I don't know, other companies, right. and try to create a new opportunity for other company. And my point yeah. of view, until now, we are very, very behind, very, very small, very, very... And uh, my question for you is now is, what is for you one of the points where we have to start uh, to try to create one of these, these cases? Um, well, you know, most of my work is is in, uh, uh, in in public policy areas and and, and you know th thematic areas that are close to to let's say the public sphere. Um, 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 but there's two points to your your question. Yes, there currently is a huge disconnect between. Uh, the people who are sort of looking at impact or policy impact and the, the people that are working with the data and because the data people are currently basically only involved in most of these discussions around these rules it's very much technology uh, oriented what's happening uh, in the discussions because there's not many people who start from okay this is what we want to achieve at the same time um, even though that realization hasn't landed everywhere yet uh, the set of rules you know, uh, 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 sets the environment for any type of data use and exchange. And that includes commercial companies like Uber, as you mentioned, that are already now uh, using that data or collecting that data. Um, and, uh, uh, and the difference is that it will now start taking place in an environment where a lot of the things that they now need to arrange contractually will then be uh, arranged by market regulations yeah, uh, so so the conditions under which anything can take place or it can't take place, uh, and that also already uh, you know shifts the focus of of the type of of uh, of discussion. But you know in general, this this flip from 
it's not about technology provision and then the fixes will come to we need to start reasoning backwards from the type of impact that we want to achieve whether that's a commercial interest or whether that's a, a, a public benefit interest or whatever uh, that's the main switch and and we're not used to it to do it that way and i already see that it will be a main obstacle in in realizing potential a lot, lot of these instruments you know, if i talk to the statistics office uh, mostly they will send their IT guys, uh, but when you start asking the policy guys, they say, you know, I have no clue what's what's coming at them. And, but that's already an existing problem. It's not caused by these new uh, legal instruments. It's an existing problem because you know, and policy guys and data people don't talk to each other and policy people will hardly go outside to actually look at reality uh, and see what's happening there and see whether their presumptions or whatever are still uh, uh, at, you know, well enough a reflection of the reality that is out there. So it's a it makes an existing problem more feasible in that sense. Thanks a lot. I hope that we, we can work together about this topic. And the yes, that would be good. You know, and and, and I've been thinking, yeah, like I'm I'm very much motivated by this entire framework in the sense that you know you've been around for a long time in these topics, right? So. Uh, we, we've been working uh, on the uh, consequences of the PSI directive and the Inspire directive for 10, 15 years now. Uh, this goes much deeper and is much broader in its intent. Um, you know, and it, it will it will be uh, the fundament under what I and probably you as well will be doing the next 15 years. And um, and so it also means that there's a need for what we did 15 years ago, which is you know weave the connections between different people and different groups, like we did for the open data community. You mentioned Spaghetti Open Data at the start of it. So, you know, we've spent years just you know, going around and tying up all those different groups of people. This, that's exactly, in my view, what's needed again. In that sense, we need to bring the band together, let's say, uh, and, and go on tour. <laughs> And and uh, but the, the the challenge now is that we're dealing with a, which uh, with a much broader playing field, so it's mm -hmm. much harder to 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 think of who is it that you really need to connect, and that starts again with where do you want to see the impact and how do you want to mobilize towards that, you know, which is something that Edge Riders, of course, has already been doing for a number of years. So um, so that might might be uh, this might be the point where where you think of okay what from the edge riders modus operandi is something that we could uh, replicate or, or, or let others replicate uh, in, in, in creating the mycelium of the network that's needed to, to really apply this. Well, maybe I'm, I'm out of scope here, but when your, your discussion on the, of the Green Deal uh, on that kind of did uh, lit a, 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 a little gorge in my in my head because I can imagine that uh, basically this is a, 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 an area where you have need of a greater amount of coordination that has been hitherto recognized. And you know <laughs> we know that this is the case everywhere. Right? See, silos are, are bad, are just uh, inefficient. People do them because it's the best they can do. But mm -hmm. I, I, when, when you miraculously can, can get to, to doing these things differently, then good things happen. And so maybe in a thing like a, the Green Deal um, or, or similar policy thrusts that have more or less the consensus of society as, as, a, as a whole, they are very well resourced. There is a dire need. There, there are... A, complex problems to solve, then people will start kind of coming together because they need to, and that will need, mean a lot of duct tape, as always, but then maybe, I, I, what, what, how I'm interpreting the data space is that the duct tape becomes easier to apply because at least you don't have to discuss on the licenses, you don't have to discuss on, on, on the low level formats. Yeah. I mean, it's already something, eh? And then uh, uh, people will kind of champion, maybe, you know, if we all do this, then we'll go much faster. And then some of these battles will be won. And this is how you create an example. And then the people outside the Green Deal can copy from that 
or, or wherever it is that the first, the first use, use cases will be doing. I, I'm going to put this down here because there's some, quite some people that know that were there at the time. So I recently was in a, in a meeting with a um, top senior manager of Europeana. Mm -hmm. And to my great surprise, that person didn't really have a perception of the importance that Europeana had 10 years ago in blazing the trail. Mm. They're like, yeah, yeah, digital strategy doesn't really work. Nobody cares. Even internally, we don't really understand it. It's, 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 it's pretty bad. And I'm like, dude, I mean, people <laughs> have been looking at what you do yeah. and it's been influential outside your organization. You may not know it because it's your, not your job to know it. You, you're not interested, but this is a, a, a you know, this idea when, when they started releasing the full, the high resolution Right. Files for the, yeah. the, the paintings of the masters in CC0. The, 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 the metadata metal. of the collection. Yeah. 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 People yeah. were like, wow, you know, look yeah. at this. And so, yeah, maybe this is the kind of stuff that, um, that uh, we are looking at. The, the big difficulty is, as, as this uh, Europeana person exemplifies, is you creating externalities. And so, by definition, you're not capturing the value. The entire value of what you do, exactly. everybody captures the entire value of what you do. Exactly. And then maybe a situation like the Green Deal could be where this is made more like part of it. It's part of what we do. It's just, it doesn't really matter. Somebody else will catch a value, but we are all in this together, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, very true. And, and I think, you know, in the entire open data discussion, we've, we've seen two approaches where either a data holding entity thought there will be some value we're convinced of that and, uh, and we don't need proof and we'll go that way uh, and the other one is uh, we'll make motivate ourselves by finding some value that is valuable to us and uh, and use that as a new and if that meets a certain threshold then, then we'll do it generically and everybody else can also create value so uh, uh, statistics office in the Netherlands, for instance, when I first started talking to them about opening up their stuff, they said, well, we're the only guys in, in the country that understand statistics. So why would we open up? Other people can only make stupid mistakes with our stuff. You know, um, <laughs> so that, yeah, and that, that's a long time ago. And then they started creating um, conversations with other people and they realized there's plenty of people out there who understands who understand statistics perfectly fine and can do interesting things with them and and as soon as they were aware that these people were out there and they uh, formed a so sort of a professional community they started releasing their data and now that's part of their feedback loop about the quality of their data you know and that is enough for them to keep doing it because there's this this benefit trickling back to them uh, that you know, um, justifies the entire effort. So that's the second path that I see. And the, the problem always is that you don't really know where the impact is, and uh, especially not sort of the surprising uses of something that you've released. And I think Europe, European is a, is a good case in point, uh, which has caused entire ripples across the entire cultural sector, uh, uh, down to the level where local archives now operate differently because European showed them the way that they could do it that way. Um, and the same is here in play and Green Deal might very well be um, uh, uh, the starting point. It is the starting point for the European Commission because they care most about that. Um, uh, at the same time, it also makes it hard to afterwards prove that it was a key element in achieving the result. You know, it's like uh, if it runs under the hood, uh, uh, whatever you've done with data and digitization and nobody realizes its core value, uh, um, then you always have the detractors later on saying, well, it wasn't needed because you know uh, we fixed it anyway. Acid rain has, has gone away. So why all the, all the noise that we had for, for years about it? You know, it's gone away. Yeah, there's a reason why it's gone away. You know? Any more questions or remarks?
Okay, I'll, I'll throw one in three, three the last the last one of my own. Okay. I, I was uh, wondering if you have an idea, Tom, of what a digital altruist organization might look like, or if they, they I, I imagine that when drafting this regulation, the, the commission of the stakeholders, they had some kind of metaphor in mind. It's gonna be something like open knowledge or something like Wikimedia or something. Do yeah, I'm, 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 what this is about yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what they had in mind, uh, but I, just yesterday I blogged in response to some criticism on the entire concept, but I think there, there's two things that uh, are important here. One is that it is an entity that is a trusted party for individuals or companies to share personal or confidential information with them. Uh, and second, that it is generally for some purpose without being specific. So it is intended for future use. So you, you, know, you provide it to this altruistic organization and they will then decide you know, uh, where that data and what type of research or whatever it will be used. Whereas current uh, uh, legislation like the GDPR always ties the data collection to the specific use it was intended for. So these altruistic organizations are you know, are a disconnect between the two. Because that disconnect is being created, additional requirements apply to that organization in terms of accountability and transparency. Um, how that might be used, uh, I think it would be entirely logical whether that a university or a network of universities would create one for uh, social research or for uh, medical research, uh, where they collect all kinds of data you know, yeah, the data from your running app or whatever, you know, a longitudinal uh, type of data sets um, uh, where they don't know yet for what type of research it will be used, but it will be in the field of you know, social research or medical research. Um, um, like I said at the start, I have been involved in projects that didn't go anywhere because we didn't have this vehicle. Um, um, I'm not sure whether you have uh, in, in other European countries have public benefit organizations. In the Netherlands, you have them. They're called ANBIs, A -N -B -Is, public benefit uh, organizations. And they're, they're similar in the sense that they that additional rules apply to them so that other people can more easily give them money as a donation. Normally, you would pay tax on a donation, but if you send your money to, to an ANBI, which is, can be a charity, but also something like the Open State Foundation, which I chair, uh, it's also an AMBI, that means it can receive uh, gifts. Um, it's, it's similar to that. It's a, um, a legal entity that has additional obligations, but also it means it can do things slightly differently. And here it is disconnecting data collection and data usage and, you know, and pushing that off to the future. Universities, groups of hospitals, um, uh, even commercial companies that want to put certain types of um, no, the NB is not the same as an NGO. Um, uh, they, they can be private entities and, and not concerned with uh, governance issues at all. Uh, the Open State Foundation is an NGO in the sense that we, we work in open government. Um, uh, so it's, it's not limited to uh, NGOs. Um, I think there are about 45,000 of them in the Netherlands, ranging from you know, uh, the local dog uh, refuge to, uh, you know, the dog shelter to, uh, you know, uh, NGOs to a charity to a uh, sports club. You know, there are the different types. And there's also the uh, uh, limited version of it, which is the SSBI, which uh, usually are associations, like neighborhood associations. And they also have additional tax exams, but also additional requirements in terms of transparency. So it seems modeled on that. Um, and actually just yesterday, I was writing down a lot of notes of whether I wanted to start a uh, data altruistic organization or uh, by extension, maybe the Edge Riders Network would want to start one. You know, if you have a specific area where you're highly interested uh, in achieving some sort of impact and there's issues with providing the right type of data for the right types of research, then having an entity like that might be uh, a good go-between. 
you know, because it reduces the, the legal uncertainty for the people that provide the data and it reduces the risks and liability issues for the ones using the data. Clear? Anyone else? Okay, then I guess we can. Uh, Andy we can even click. has its own uh, Wikipedia page in English. Let's see if I can find that. So let me go to the English one. Yes. So that's the English translation of an NB. Um, um, in the Netherlands, this is geared to being able to receive, receive tax-free gifts and, and, and legates, um, uh, which is not the point for a data altruist, uh, altruistic entity, of course. Uh, but it also that there's in, uh, in Dutch law, there's a, a, a summation of areas where these organizations might be active in, so sectors or themes that they might be active on. And, uh, and that's of interest here. Ed, no, uh, also, yeah, they they are nonprofits, uh, Veronica. So, so all of, all of the AMBIs are nonprofits, uh, but, but not, not all nonprofits are AMBIs. I get it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, and that's true for the data data altruistic entities as well. They are required to be nonprofits. Yeah. Okay. On that note, uh, we went a bit over time, but. Um, Personally, I have no problem with that. I had a lot of fun. If uh, there's no more questions, I would thank Tom. You're welcome. Uh, and say bye to everybody. Let's uh, let's and and, this. and and feel free to get in touch uh, uh, with additional questions or you know if you want pointers to where legislation can be found, that sort of thing. That's um, uh, uh, all fine. Yeah, great. Um, I am already asking for if you could uh, put the link uh, to your slides on the chat. Yeah. And uh, the next move it will be I will put this like add a screen, like a title screen, and then put it on YouTube and then tell everybody, uh, make it available. Okay. Thank you all for your uh, time and attention and the discussion. And uh, let's continue at some point at, uh, in the near future. Indeed. Thank you for yours. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.